Welcome to the Go Beyond Disruption podcast. It's brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants, the unified voice of the AICPA and SEMA. Every week, we share insights from inside the accounting and finance profession that help you stay ahead of the curve, whatever business you're in. From our office in the City of London, I'm Kyle Hannan. While I'm a voice you will already know, even though it may sound a little scratchy because I'm fighting a cold at the moment, I'm grateful about the fact that you're about to hear another voice, one that's new to you. It belongs to my colleague Ian Selby. He will be introducing our guest, a visiting professor from Australia who Ian had invited to speak at a special event recently at our London office. First, a bit about Ian. He's not only our Vice President of Global Research and Development in Management Accounting, He also serves on the advisory board of a business school at the University of New South Wales in Australia. His guest, the one you're about to hear him introduce, is Professor Nick McGuigan, an expert who sits right where those two worlds meet, right at the fusion point of academia and of professional innovation in an era of disruption. Visiting the UK just as the World Economic Forum Summit was beginning in Davos, Switzerland, Professor McGuigan's message is a powerful one. It touches on innovation, on accountability, and on the deepening relevance of our profession's unique expertise. And that is a message that's striking a chord with more and more people inside and outside the world of finance. And it's a message you're about to hear right now. It's a recording of a recent lecture delivered here at our office in mid-January 2020 and introduced by Ian Selby. He is published widely in international accounting and education journals, and he's been invited to present research centers and professional organizations in the US, UK, Europe, South America, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, He won an award in 2019. Yeah. It it feels like this is your life in the sense that I'm saying. Kind of feels like it when you're reading it, Um, yeah. (laughs) uh, Ideas worth teaching award at the Aspen Institute New York. He instigated Monash Business School's new creative artist in residency program. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, at Monash, you know, uh, Nick is a seminal thinker. Nick is pushing the boundary with all the thinking that Monash is doing in accountancy and business. Um, he's also conceptually designed the world's first ever accounting perfume, okay, which you might talk about today. Um, together with the accounting profession, he's embarking upon research that investigates a queer perspective of accounting. Uh, He's an international outreach chair for the American Accounting Association's teaching and learning curriculum section. He's an invited member to form the European Accounting Association's Education Task Force, and he co-chaired the Accounting and Finance Association of Australia and New Zealand Accounting Education Special Interest Group. Uh, So he's got various other roles. He's here to talk to us. Just take a breath and listen to what he's got to say. If you have any questions, don't be scared to ask a question. Okay, do ask any question you want. It is designed to be a safe space where you can talk freely. Yeah, okay? Okay. for sure. Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you, everyone. <clears throat> thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, so we desire, or we created the Accountability Institute because we were globally. We thought they weren't really doing enough and so we wanted to do something a bit more provocative. We wanted to work a lot more with artists, we wanted to work with um, activists, hacktivists, other types of individuals. We wanted to kind of create a different type of space. So we created the Accountability Institute and we did a lot of public spacing, more creative things that I couldn't do as an associate professor in a business school. And then I kind of moved to Monash and they sort of liked what I was doing and Now I do a lot more of it for Monash rather than the Accountability Institute as much. So it was kind of an interesting dilemma. I still don't think we do enough and I want to talk a little bit about that and how we're trying to rethink. So the idea of the title is developing a 2020 vision. I use the 2020 vision, I like that it's a new decade. And I also like that a 2020 vision means that I can see everyone in the room without these glasses, which is impossible for me. So I think we really do need to think about rethinking accounting globally for a different type of era and a different type of de- decade. And I think we could start to do this in a lot, um, in a lot more um, action or, or a lot stronger than what we have been. And that's why I'm talking about a brave new world. So I'll talk about what I mean by that too. 
Um, this is Sydney projected into the year 2030. So this is the kind of visioning around the city of Sydney. This will be our city um, of Sydney in the year 2030. So it's very, it's, it's obviously built on growth, of course. So this is Sydney in the year 2030. This is what we project it, it's going to be like. So it's built on growth and it's built on technology as, as kind of a, a solution to some of our problems. The one problem I have with that image is that's New South Wales if you look a couple of, um, you know, two, three hundred kilometres outside of Sydney. That's kind of what it looks like. We've got farmers committing suicide. We've got multinational companies trying to do our agriculture and pushing off local farms. Um, not only are they committing suicide, but we've got major natural disasters. So that's obviously Australia at the moment. And I know that you will have seen these images. Um, but it's a pretty kind of scary environment to be in in Sydney. Um, or in Australia in general. Um, and I kind of thought it would be remiss if I didn't include an image like that. So where I'm really concerned about is the idea of climate change, I think is a really big concern that we're facing. But it's not just climate change. We've got too many humans on the planet. And that's causing us, uh, like a population explosion, that's causing us problems, I think, too. Um, next to that is the idea of migration. So if, if that was kind of Australia, it's not necessarily possible for us to live in certain areas perhaps anymore and so therefore us as Australians we had a really bad record obviously with our refugee uh, crisis in Australia so we, we placed them in offshore detention centres and kind of locked them up and forgot about them sort of and I'll talk about that soon um, we need to find a solution to this because it could be us having to migrate somewhere else uh, so that's a kind of a concern the other thing we're concerned about is in the accountability institute is this idea of food security how we grow food, where we grow fruit, food, how we're going to produce food. Is, is technology the solution to food growth? What does that actually mean? Because it hasn't really been tested human health as to what our bodies will, will kind of result in. We don't, that's kind of an unknown. And then next to that is limited natural resources. The thing is, all of these issues, and they're not the only ones, but they're all systemic. They're all operating at a global level and they need collaboration to try and solve some of those problems. And then we've got our situation, our, what I look at in the business school, we've got our economic systems kind of stuck somewhere in the middle of that. The, our economic system was really interesting. It was designed on unlimited growth, clearly. It requires growth, obviously, to survive. It, these other issues around it are kind of halting that slightly and saying, hang on a minute, we might not be able to unlimitedly grow. In the past, we've always been able to colonize and, and create different resources and access to those resources. Or we've gone to war and we destroy and then rebuild and the economy goes up and et cetera, et cetera. So we've kind of designed this economic system built on unlimited growth, which is kind of over here. And then at the same time, we've been discovering over time that actually the Earth's planets is kind of finite resources. We can't necessarily grow. And so we've got this situation where we've got this kind of social organisation, this social construction that humans have made, and it's a way of organising ourselves. It's kind of here, but our limited natural planetary resources are here. Our ecosystem in which we have to operate is sort of sitting here. At some point, there will be a reset. There's no doubt about that. We've witnessed that in Australia. And, the, and I'm so passionate about the Australian thing because the fire was 200 kilometres from my house. Um, so it's, it's real. We, we do kind of live with that environment. At some point, it's going to reset itself. Do we redesign the system as humans and, and think about a more natural reset? Or do we wait for the climate change to be able to reset itself? Is my interest. And then the thing is, at the, the same time, society's starting to understand more of these issues and how they come together. And they're kind of telling us, hang on a minute, we don't want that so much anymore. And you can see, I think Australia is sort of, for me, I was kind of living through it from Germany, watching what was happening to Australia. So I was really curious how the international press, because often that's covered when you're living in Australia with, with what own press, et cetera, right? Um, so I was really interested looking above, above it and watching what was happening and watching our governance or lack of governance unfold. And to me, Australia is kind of like the canary in the, in the mine, if you like. Um, this is what we could have to live with into our futures. So that's why I kind of see business as unusual now. Um, but the bit I'm interested in is how do we start to prepare for that business as unusual? Um, because I don't think we can continue with this 
the way we currently do. And I think accounting plays a really big role. The problem with accounting, I see it, is that we often in universities teach it as a really technical discipline. It's very objective and there's a right or a wrong. And it's a kind of a numerical language which simplifies the complexity behind it. I think we need to reset our ways of thinking around accounting to be much more around a systems design process. So here's a system. I like this system because it shows the contradictions between it. So if we really want to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, something like economic growth is impossible, I think. Because there's contradictions and, and compromises that humans will have to make, and we call that the design process. In other words, if we have these 17 goals that contradict and they're complex and they work together in unison integratedly, how do we make those compromises to be able to design a system that works to achieve those 17 goals? And that's difficult. That's something we have to get our heads around. So there's one system. A second system that we, uh, two individuals developed in Australia is called PIMA Culture. It stands for Permanent Agriculture. It's a sustainability system. I'm just talking a little bit about it because you might not be familiar with it. It's a design system built for sustainable life of humans. So it's a human design system. It's meant to maximize the human, but it's done in a sustainable way. So we have three ethics, look after the earth, look after people, and fair share. Fair share is the economics component, if you like. So we go into public and, and we teach on these sustainability courses around the kind of social economic part of the, the permaculture courses. Looking after those three ethics, you've got 12 design principles. So these are ways that you can design your garden for maximum utility, abundance, because nature produces in abundance if it's done properly. So for example, companion planting came out of permaculture. It was a design system designed in the 1970s. It was done, as I said, in Australia, but it was looking at 40 indigenous cultures around the world. So it was trying to learn from indigenous cultures and put them into a model of sustainable design. I was really curious about permaculture, and what I'm starting to think about is if, if that's a way to design a garden, why couldn't you design like a community through permaculture? And if you could do a community, could you do a business? And if you could do a business, could you do a kind of city and a city's designed around permaculture principles and ethics. And then if you were designing a city that way, could you then design a global economic environment that way? Then of course we've got our accounting kind of reporting based solution to this idea of systems design, which is the idea of integrated reporting of course. We know that integrated reporting takes integrated thinking. You have to be able to think integratedly in order to produce an integrated report of course. Where I'm really interested in is that a lot of the work being done by both professional bodies and actually a lot of academics, as well as in practice, is that integrated thinking at the organisational level is what we're often discussing. The organisation has to think in an integrated way. Great, fine. I'm much more interested in the individual level because unless the individuals can think in an integrated way, we will never be able to achieve integrated thinking at an at a organisational level. So how do we actually get the individuals that are making these decisions around the room or producing the integrated report to be able to think in that integrative way? And so it led me to the 1960s actually in uh, the US. There was a couple of really eccentric psychologists and they created a conceptual systems theory of learning. It was a neo-Piagian uh, theory, so it was taking Piaget's developmental process of, of children and it was developing it for this kind of integrative type of thinking. And what they discovered, or they, they used two kind of angles here, they talked about conceptual complexity, I need to move, on the left hand side, and then on the, um, the bottom they talked about one's orientation to authority. Can they think independently, do they need some type of authority for um, idea around them or context? And what they discovered, there was kind of four types of integrative thinking. What I'm really interested about this model is that it's a developmental process. So you start to move through from concrete through to abstract type of thinking. Concrete, you've got a fixed mindset, you can't kind of shift. That's not going to work with integrative thinking. You have to have a very open kind of mindset to move towards the stages of integrative thinking. But what I found fascinating about it is that it explains kind of the contradictions in human thinking. In other words, you can be very concrete in a particular context, and you can be very abstract in another type of context. So depending on the context and what you're talking about, a human can operate at these different levels of integrative thinking. 
So then in 1981, so that was in the 1960s, they did 30 years of empirical research over it. During that period of time, Miller got hold of it in 1981 and turned it, to, or took this conceptual systems theory and started talking about it from an uh, environmental education perspective. And what he kind of found was that that type four type of thinking, that style four, that really integrative thinking, requires these three kind of key things. Complexity, ability to deal with complexity, ability to be adaptable, and an ability to have an open mind. So I was kind of looking at those three things and I was really curious about them. Like, how do we design learning experiences at universities or business schools or professional education? How do you design learning experiences for accountants in that context? How do you create an accountant with an open mind when I'm teaching them debits and credits where they're, they're thinking about it from, as a technical tool? And what happens in my future that I've sort of suggested when we're no longer accounting for money because as humans, we've realized that money is actually not we, what we should be accounting for. It's meaningless. It's completely socially constructed and it's used as a medium of exchange rather than storage. What happens if we're accounting for water because we're so desperate for the water usage? And we're gonna to have to seriously think about who gets water and how it's allocated and maybe we have to give up wine, perhaps. <laughs> Um, but the idea of it is, what are, how do you open our minds to this idea of accounting systems and how they might operate? Accounting doesn't necessarily care what it accounts for, necessarily. Yeah? It's agnostic in that respect. Um, but it's our monetary value consumption that, uh, assumption that we might just need to kind of park in the future. Imagine what would happen to accounting if we took that one assumption out. Interesting. Um, so I was thinking about how you design learning experiences in that context. And then I was also going to the 21st century um, futures kind of process where they were talking about six disruptive factors. And what I was really curious about is in Australia, we've got kind of these threshold learning outcomes. All accountants should be able to communicate. And I thought, oh man, that's like really, that's kind of obvious that they have to communicate. What's not so obvious is how do I develop an ability for an accountant to have a transdisciplinary perspective? that an accountant can think across all of the different functions. Not just be able to take those functions and have a communicative conversation, they can actually open their mind and try to place themselves in a different perspective within the organization. So I was really curious about transdisciplinarity. I was really curious about a design mindset. How do I develop a design mindset or a systems thinking approach in my accounting graduates? Well, it's obvious I have to work more with artists, right? That kind of makes sense. Um, so that's kind of now what I do. This is what I think we're doing in business schools, to be fair. And you can, you can critique me on this. I'm totally open to that. But it doesn't matter where I go, anywhere in the world, I think an accounting degree is the same. You can shoot me down for sure. And I know that there's pockets of innovation. But essentially, I can guarantee if I put an Australian graduate with a UK graduate, they'd pretty much come out the same process, in a way. Um, I think we're producing products for an industrialization age. And that worked. That was really good. That's where it got us to today. But it's not going to get us into the future. This idea of a standard education approach where everyone gets the same stuff and no one can uniquely connect to it, because that's what all of the education research is saying, in order to learn, you have to be able to connect to what you're learning. And it has to make meaning to yourself. Um, how do we change that model? So in accounting education, we acknowledge that we need a broader education. My PhD was in accounting education. I looked at all of the reports from 1905 to 2015 was the very last one. It was done in Australia. These are reports by professional bodies, by academic research. Um, the very first article in accounting education was published in 1905. It said we need to give accounting students a broader education. The exact last report, 2015, 110 years later, was saying the same thing. The only difference was the language changed. So what I don't think we've realized as educators or accountants in general is how do you reimagine accounting? How do you reimagine the education of accountants? How can we, we know it has to be a broader way of thinking, but when I talk to my colleagues, they're like, yeah, I can teach critical thinking. Well, no, no, you, you, you can't teach it. In other words, they approach it from a content perspective. 
So critical thinking, if accountants need to be thinking in a critical way, that's just more content to cover in classes. We need to really start to think about how we reimagine the content into actual experiences. It's about trying to experience that level of critical thinking or whatever the attribute might be. Thinking of reimagination, I went to Bauhaus. Does, do you know Bauhaus? 100 year centenary of Bauhaus, right? So I spent about a month, I think, in Germany traveling through Berlin, Weimar, and Dessau, where Bauhaus was located. And I really just wanted to follow the Bauhaus trail. I wanted to go to the restaurants where they were. Some of them still exist. I wanted to go to where they lived. It was quite eccentric. One was living in a park in a tower. Um, I really wanted to go and look at what was happening at Bauhaus. And what I uncovered in Bauhaus was that they had the same problem we have. I think we have a problem. And that is in our way of educating, we educate financial accounting, management accounting, auditing, and we see it in very siloed boxes, which was happening in Bauhaus in the 1920s in Germany, that art was being educated in different silos. And there was no ability to integrate those silos together. So Bauhaus came along and took all of those different types of art and science together, and they created the Bauhaus principles of design and the school, of course, uh, in Dessau. And what was really interesting is it's a completely different curricular model. It's circular. So the approach was as long as a student takes a preliminary course in the Bauhaus, they can navigate their way to the center any which way they want. And they can start to integrate their learning. So in other words, if they're interested and they want to take classes on stone, clay, glass, and plastics, they can start to, to involve or navigate themselves to here. And then they might navigate themselves back to here because now they've discovered that that interests them more. And then they go towards the center. So it's a much more kind of fluid model of education, if you like. And it tries to integrate the approach of education together. So I was really curious about Bauhaus. And then I discovered they had the Bauhaus principles of learning. So I thought to myself, how do I educate accounting students in a way where they could start to question the obvious, they could find out things for themselves, they could use their body as a primary tool? I'm really struggling um, with that notion, like how do you use your body in a classroom? But we're experimenting, and there's a person in the UK doing that. So she asks her accounting students to dance accounting as a form of communication. Um, how do they practice more? How do they play and explore? And how do they value the whole process rather than the outcomes? How do I transition them away from thinking about the exam or the content, etc., to the actual learning process? Well, part of it is easy. You just abandon exams. Um, exams are, again, that kind of standard human model wrapped up in plastic. Um, so I was th this is kind of where I think maybe accounting programs could go into the future, or education in general is going this way. It'll become much more inquiry-based learning, and that's already happening. And I don't mean case studies. I don't mean giving students a case study. That's a very, um, I don't know, it's a way of teaching, but it's, it's not necessarily inquiry-based. I'm curious about students going out there and coming, coming up with things. So for example, if I was taking them through the conceptual framework, I would ask students to go out and take photographs of what it means to account for society. And they bring those photographs back into a classroom and then they start to distill the different photographs from the different students and they start to think about what that actually means. And then they start to come up with the principles of a conceptual framework. And then you take them through into the professional type of conceptual framework where they actually understand those different principles. Um, it'll be discovery and exploration, informal in nature. I think there's a, there's a nice um, literature now coming through about learning as informal rather than always in an institution or formalized. Um, this idea of contextual appreciation I'll talk more about. Multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary and also integrated, and I'll talk more about how we're doing that, along with both creating things in an active way and playing. You know, the, the re education research says we learn the most between the ages of, a re of obviously zero through to about four or five, when we're playing all the time. And we get indoctrined out of play. I like to get our students to play as much as possible. Um, I use Baxter McGolder's constructivist developmental pedagogy. So it's linked to this idea of integrative thinking. There's, she says there's three ways or three principles involved in any education relationship. One is that you validate the students as knowers, that they actually have something to bring to the classroom. And you need to tap into that type of knowledge. So I do that as much as possible. The other one is that we learn together that as, as, as students and educator, we're learning both together. So I can learn as much 
probably for my students as they can learn from me. So we try and create this more equal balance, if you like. And the other one was um, setting the experience in the student's context. So sending them out to their environments to take photographs of what it means to account for society means I've set the conceptual framework straight away in the, in the lives of the individual student, which I find really interesting. So I now see the type of education process as a form of curation. I, my job as an educator is to try and curate different learning experiences to take students through and help and facilitate them with that type of knowledge making process or sense making process themselves. And so I want to use that and talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing with students and then some of the things we're doing with educators to rethink some of the educators. What I didn't mention, when Miller did the study in 1981, he looked at different disciplines within different universities in the US. And what he found in 1981, if you think about that model of four stages, he actually found there were very few students with an integrative mindset by the time they left university. What I find worse, and I'm not, I, I, there's been no studies since 1981, so I don't know this. I'm just going anecdotally. But what I found worse was in 1981, he also found there were very few accounting prof uh, sorry, professors in different disciplines who could think in an integrative way. And that sort of rang alarm bells somehow. There needs to be a, a more modern study done, I think, on that. Um, but if, if we think about what these, some of these experiences to take through with students, one is I'm about developing the whole individual. So with accounting students, I use a Japanese concept called ikigai. And ikigai I find really interesting because it's, it's taking the accounting, it's putting the learning process um, and their career into themselves in a really kind of innate, reflective way. So the idea behind ikigai is that you think about what you love doing, and that isn't always what you can be paid for. Although if you can find it, it's a nice balance, right? Um, we also think about what the world needs on one side and what we're good at doing. And then a student can start to see, actually, that's a really complex system. And the complex system of thought is me. Me as a student, I'm thinking about myself. What I love doing isn't always what I'm paid for. There's a compromise that has to happen. And the idea of ikigai is finding the sense of purpose. So the, the idea is you navigate through these different worlds into your sense of purpose. And then you start to create, create a type of career accordingly. Yeah? Um, but what I like doing about this is it's, if I'm getting students to think about accounting as a system, like a system design of a business, I can't throw that to a student straight away because they have no context in which to play with that system. They, they haven't been the CEO. They're not on the board of directors. There is no meaning, sense-making for them. So it's all imaginative in that respect, and therefore they don't hold that kind of information. So, but if I set the system inside themselves first, then they can start to bring those learnings into that context of business. So we get students to play around with ikigai a little bit, developing their kind of professional career. We also ask students to create their own forms of um, integrated reports. So we ask them to think about the different capitals, the six capitals, and their daily transactions. So as they go to work or they go to school or they, they live, they start to think about every transaction across all of those six capitals. So if you're buying a new Apple computer, what is the, the environmental cost of that computer? What is the social cost of that computer? Um, what is the, not only what is the financial cost of that computer. So they start to actually think within systems. They start to think about their own actions as they live in relation to this. And then they start to put this information into the integrated report. And that becomes the kind of final seminal piece of work is their integrated report. We ask them to think about it in different contexts, themselves as personal, or we think about it from a, a business perspective if they're, if they're wanting to create their own business. We also developed a case study on the refugee crisis. So as the refugee crisis in Australia was unpacking and people were um, protesting on the streets in, in our major cities, we designed an accounting-based case study. So I went to the company Broad Spectrum's annual reports and I asked the students to take those reports, so the company that was behind the offshore detention centres, I asked them to analyse from our perspective in accounting and finance whether you'd want to invest in that company. So do the whole financial ratio analysis. And of course you would. It's a really good company. It's liquid. It's um, operating expenses are decreasing. Profitable, uh, it's profitable, um, et cetera. You'd want to invest in that company. Then I get them to watch a documentary called Chasing Asylum, which is a film 
and it's, she's an Australian, she now lives in the US. She, it was illegal for anyone going to those offshore detention centres to record, to talk, to, to do anything, to talk to journalists. They weren't able to record anything, etc. She asked medical staff to wear hidden cameras inside their um, clothing, and then she filmed what was happening inside those detention centres, and that's what kind of we were able to then get the knowledge and, and act accordingly. But um, they watched that documentary and I asked them to reflect. So that's the account, the financial or the accounting view. Now you know how their operating expenses are decreasing. And what are we thinking about that? And so we get them to really think about the kind of how accounting language, the num we often can hide behind the numbers, the numbers and the way that they're being communicated, what does that actually mean in reality? The other thing we do, so after the ikigai, we take them to a garden. So this is a garden on campus at Monash in one of our campuses. It's a permaculture garden. So I'm really curious to explore systems making by actually taking them to an ecosystem. And what we can actually observe, because we ask permaculturalists to explain the garden to them and how it's being designed, how it's been set up, and they start to look at the interactions. So they look at what's happening in the garden and they see natural forms of reactions and they can see how complex that system actually is and how much thought has gone into that system. And then we start to translate that metaphor of a permaculture ecosystem into the, the accounting system as an as a, um, operating space for business. The other thing we do, and I sent a paper through on, on this, is that I employed a couple of um, artists. This, this is a design collective um, in Sydney and they're um, called Fictions. And they took us through this idea of futuring. And so there's often these reports that are coming from SEMA and other professional accounting bodies around what is the future of accounting, what is the future of finance, and all the good work that you do. And I take those reports and I ask the students to think about those reports. So it's kind of really useful information to get students to open their mind. What I'm really curious about is how do I get them away from debits and credits and the technical approach into a much more holistic perspective of, of the system? And so I use what your work um, with this futuring process, and I asked them to think about what is their relationship back 20 years ago. So this was images, obviously, from 2017. But 20 years ago, how did you think about accounting? In other words, you're in the year 2037, and you're thinking back to your relationship with accounting all that time ago. And instantly, I'm putting them into a future perspective, yeah, or trying to, through that process. Using your reports that they've looked at pre to coming to the, the environment, I'm asking them to think about what are the structural changes that are going to impact humans into the future and what are the relational or behavioural changes that are going to occur on humans into the future. Thinking about both of those things. And then I'm getting them to start to think about this kind of quadrant analysis. So they're taking one structural concern and one um, relational or behavioural concern and they're starting to create this quadrant. Accountant students at least really like it because it's still quite sort of... Um, it's not too creative as a, as a futuring process. It's still quite logical with your, your quadrant analysis, right? But if you've got these different quadrants with the structural and the relational behavioural changes, we can start to see that there are four quadrants, which mean four different futures. And what we ask our students to do is we start to, through these different types of questions, we start to get them to think about what would accounting look like in a decentralised, highly technological world? What would accounting look like in a really centralised uh, technological world? What would accounting look like in a really centralised, non-technological world, etc.? And so they start to, because our students are really afraid or they're anxious about future employment and all of this notion around what are they going to do for jobs, what's accounting of the future going to be, are we a dying um, industry? And we get them to populate a lot of these different futures and then they start to see, okay, well if accounting operates like this, if this is what a professional bodies are said is going to be the structural and behavioural kind of changes that are coming, and this is where account, we've imagined how accounting is going to be, then we can start to take some of those scenarios, they can tell their stories and summarise them. You can tell this is a really nice group of accountants, right? It's really logical and it's nicely positioned. Um, but the idea is they can take that future and they can start to plan accordingly. And so they walk back, what are the skill sets that are going to be required for me as an accountant into the future, and how am I going to gain, um, gather those, gain them? And it might not be doing a formal accounting course, it might actually be going and working with a few artists that might be able to open my mind. So we do futuring. I want to talk briefly about some of the things we're doing with academics, because I see academics partly as the problem. Um, we've 
from 1981, we've got this idea of a textbook educator. At least we do in Australia, right? So a 12-chapter textbook, a 12-chapter, a 12-week course, what's well, really easy, like let's fit one chapter to one week, etc. How do you get individuals to think outside of a, a book or a textbook? Yeah? And how do you design these open-mindedness or these different learning experiences? First of all, I think we need to teach accounting as a social construction, that it actually is a social science, it's not a science. It's been invented by humans for human organizing, which means it can absolutely change. I know what I'm saying in that respect. I know how mammoth that is going to be. But I also know that if we don't physically change that system, then you're probably going to have that ice age up here as we are burning down there. Yeah? So this is something humans are going to have to get their heads around. And we can only really do that if we can start to think in a much more holistic or integrated way. Part of that is we need to start teaching it as a social construction, that accounting has changed over time and it can change again. Yeah? Um, so I, I use art to do this a lot, and I do it a lot with academics. And I want to talk about a couple of these art projects. I'm interested in art because it can... Um, oh, actually, I'll, t I'll tell you why I'm interested. Does anyone know who this is? Abramovich? Yes. Yeah, Marina Abramovich, right. So we went, Thomas and I went to an exhibition of hers in Sydney. And it was really, really strange. So I had to take all of my devices away and, and couldn't have anything. And then they gave me these earmuffs, these black earmuffs. And then we walked into this space in the Sydney docks. So the, they have the, the different docks. And she had taken over a whole thing. And she had these different experiences. And so when I walked into this room, into this space, someone in black came up to me and just sort of slowly, it was really slow, right? And they kind of just grabbed my hand. And then they just guided me to, to an exercise. And I thought, oh, that's... I actually thought that was kind of comforting. Like, I haven't had that kind of... With a stranger, I thought, human connection, that's interesting, but relaxing kind of, Or it was comforting, that another human interaction. And then I went to this exercise, and we, I did the exercise. And then I went away from the exercise, and then another person in black just came up and grabbed sort of slowly grabbed my, my arm and guided me to the next exercise, which was this row of beds. And then, um, that's my New Zealand accent, sorry. Um, beds, and then sh the person lay me inside the bed and then tucked me into bed like my parents would do when I was little. And I thought, oh, that's kind of calming. Um, I was there, I think, because you lose, you lose any idea of time. Um, I was there, I think, for like um, an hour or so, an hour and a half. Thomas walked out of it about half an hour afterwards. He was totally oh, freaked. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. And you were totally freaked out and thought, wow, this is like a German Nazi concentration camp. <laughs> so what we realised at that moment in time was how art can do different things to different people. It can totally open one's mind or it can close one's mind or it can do all sorts of really interesting things when you both experience something like that. That's been completely curated, obviously. Um, we see education as being able to do the same kind of thing. So I, uh, Ian had mentioned I created the Monash Business School's Accounting and Resident, uh, artist in Residence program. So it's the, world, it's the only artist program where we bring an artist, a living artist, into an accounting department like we would a visiting professor. So I employ an artist to spend time with us. And the idea is that the artist will disrupt us as much as possible. So their role really is to take over the coffee machine, the water coolers, to knock on people's offices and have a conversation about different things art related. The artists are mostly, the ones we've used at the moment are all performance artists, and they have worked in the kind of accounting, finance, business, economic type space before. So their work is grounded in this. It gives them, an, it's a kind of a mutual um, collaboration because they are able to find out more from us as academics about their practice, and they can also disrupt our practice as well. So we get them to live with us. Literally, we have apartments, because our business school is right next to the design school, and the de design school has two apartments inside it. So we literally ask them to live on campus. <coughs> and they're living with us for two weeks, um, as a visiting professor would do, so they have an office, etc. And I want to just show you an example of what this one particular artist did. Her name's Beck Conroy. She was Sydney-based. We took her down to Melbourne. And we put it in our boardroom. So part of this is that our business school is really hierarchical. And all the important people sit on the top three floors. And all the other people don't have access to those floors. And you can't get into the nice, plush, um, I know, right? You can't get into the nice, plush kind of uh, 
lunch places and bathrooms, of course. So I wanted to play with that a lot. And we have this kind of boardroom space that we have all of our important meetings in. So I put her in the boardroom and asked her to disrupt it as much as possible. And I'll show you images of how we do that. Um, but her project, so the artist has to create a piece of art while she, they are with us in the business school. They have to use our staff, our students, and accounting professionals. So it has to involve all three. There's a lot of work being done about how academics and industry don't work enough together. I wanted to do something which forces them to work together, and an artist can do it. So it's got to be about that process, and the artwork has to be about accounting. So we thought, what, why not start the project by dating accountants? So we literally asked the artist to date six accountants. So she physically went on dates in front of three cameras on a Saturday night. So she dated one of our students, sorry, two of our students, one of our staff members, and three professional accountants working in practice. And they came in and they had no idea what was going to happen, what was going on. They just said that we're, it's, a rem, it's a date. And so we put them in front of the cameras and then we just let the cameras go for half an hour and they had their date. Yeah. Um, and then what we did is we cut... I'll talk about it when I show images, actually. So this is Beck. She's coming in. She's kind of quite heavily tattooed. It's not common in an accounting department, or I haven't seen a professor that way before. She doesn't wear shoes either, and that was confronting for some people. Um, so, but she's, a trained, she's trained using her body. So her PhD is in body uh, movement, if you like. And so she knows how to use her body to elicit reactions. Um, and so we knew kind of what we were doing. So she comes into the business school. She talks about some of her projects in the past. Um, she looks, this is with Thomas in the offices. And then we put her, this is her in the situation where she's going to be dating. We hired a professional actor to be the waiter. We had makeup artists doing the makeup. And then we had the three different cameras around where she's starting to date. So here she's dating an accounting professional working. And the idea was having a conversation on how do we measure love. Has anyone, some of you are probably a little bit of an accounting background, have you ever tried to measure love, like account for love? We were really curious about trying to measure love. And so we were having this kind of salacious conversation about love. And then one of our professional bodies in Australia heard about the project. They really loved the project. And so they ended up launching the project. So we took these half-hour dates in one night so she dated everybody in one night, but she didn't go home with anyone. <laughs> um, I promise. So it was half-hour dates, and then we condensed those half-hour dates into 10-minute slots, so they were edited, and they created a 60-minute film. And we launched that 60-minute film at our professional account at one of our professional accounting bodies, and they even created these I Love Accounting bags, which we were really super excited about. Um, because when you take one of those to an accounting conference, everyone knows who you are. Yeah? <laughs> Um, but, and we did a professional kind of panel situation where we talked about why we brought the artist. So I was doing the whole kind of spiel, why do I bring an artist into a business school? It's about opening people's minds. And it's about trying to find synergy between a social science and something that we teach from a scientific perspective. Um, but also from a research perspective, how do you use art as a way to collect and document the type of research we do in, in business schools? And what we also did is we launched it publicly. So the reason why we use the dating situation is that everyone understands as humans the dating kind of process or going on a date. It's, it's quite commonly understood. Everyone thinks about accountants as these kind of geeks and they're nerdy, and it's really hard to break that stereotype. And we wanted to bring those two things together in a really public way that humans would be able to understand and see. So we exhibited the actual film inside a real live art exhibition in the city of Melbourne as well. And I... If, if you just bear with me, I'd really like to show you just a, a Google trailer of this so you can get an insight. Okay, so um, as, what was really interesting about that experiment was in the end where it gets to the point where sh they're really starting to think about what happens when art and accounting cross over and that's the kind of space that I'm really curious to play in now, is, is what happens when you do take artists and accountants and you put them together, and what types of conversations can they have, and where could accounting be taken? 
Um, I've also part of a looking at uh, the Australian educators. I, I was in charge for seven years, I think, and we kind of of accounting educators and we were designing conferences for accounting educators and the whole idea of that was over time to gradually open their minds. The very last one we organised was on um, accounting education and the senses. So how can you smell, touch, see, hear, taste accounting? How could you educate accounting by using the human senses? And the smell is one of our most powerful senses as humans. We can start to think back uh, in terms of memory is triggered a lot by smell. And so to do that at the conference, I worked with a New Zealand perfumer to create a perfume of accounting. We tried to conceptualise if accounting had a smell, what, what could it smell like? And then the perfumer got really super excited um, and created actually three. So she created three perfumes. And I'll talk about those different perfumes. But we launched them inside a fashion design house. So in Auckland in New Zealand, there's a fashion company called World. And I asked if they would launch the perfume, and we did it by taking annual reports from Australia and New Zealand, and we matched the annual report with a smell. So if the annual report had a smell, what would it smell like? So if you get a dairy company, what would the company smell like? We found a, a perfume that was made from milk. And so what we were trying to do was that perfumes can tell a story, or they have a story, the annual report is a story of an organisation's performance. And we were really playing with the story and the narratives to be having this conversation and this perfume masterclass that would take accounting and merge it with um, art, if you like. So we put our academics in this space, which as you can see is kind of an overload for the sensors. Um, and then they started to smell the different perfumes. And then we launched the perfume. So we had three. One was called Balance, and it smelt a bit like vanilla. So it was everything is in balance, everything's comfortable. And the perfumer had a conversation. Uh, she was having dinner with her accounting friend, and someone called a client called the accountant, and he answered the phone, and his behavior changed. So he sort of sat up in the, the chair at the restaurant, and he just said in a really kind of soft and calm voice to kind of reassure the, the client. So it was a really interesting kind of um, connection the, uh, the perfumer made, and she created this perfume called Balance. The other is called 80085, um, and that smells like uh, invoices, taxes, and hard work. So it's really playing with the numbers associated with accounting. Um, it's also a reference to the patriarchal context of accounting. So if you, if you kind of, an accounting joke of the 80s was if you typed that into your calculator, and then you could figure out what that actually is. And it really was trying to, it was really trying to, in a nice, subtle way, uh, critique the patriarchy of our, of our profession. Um, the other thing we do, it created was Sex, Power and Taxes. It was the most um, fav favorite of the perfumes. It smelled very intense, and it was this kind of um, relationship between the cold, stark exteriors of kind of corporations and banks. So I'm doing another project where I'm photographing stock exchanges around the world. And if you look at stock exchanges, they are all very uh, off-putting. In fact, you, often you can't come in. And I had this experiment in Milan where I dressed as a tourist. I was wearing shorts and jandals, flip-flops, whatever you, you know what I mean by flip -flops. So I was wearing the jandals and I was trying to get myself into the stock exchange in Milan. And of course, I wasn't able to do that. But I was questioning the security guards over and over and over and I was edging my way towards, and then I could see other security guards coming towards me. And I was kind of curious how far I could get without being arrested or, or you know, having a, a, a more serious conversation. So I'm really interested in this cold exteriors of organisations and then the plush interiors that occupy them. And so that perfume was playing with those ideas. Um, the last project, and I'll end with this, is we're doing a project called Queering Accounting. Again, it's, a, it's, slightly about, it's about the logics of accounting. So queering, the original word of queering, is, is the exact opposite to the norm. So if this is the normal way of thinking and accounting, what would be the opposite of that? That's really where that word originated. And so we're very curious to play around in a world of creativity, innovation, and leadership, what, where could the accounting profession be going from a queer perspective? And also a queer perspective had never been talked about or used or kind of we are trying to find queer sites where queer individual accountants have queered the workplaces. 
So in, in Australia, we're trying to locate some of those sites, and we've got a paper coming out this year about that. Um, so we're really trying to disrupt accounting through that queer voice. We're using, in a militant way in some ways, we're going back to the rebellion because it was the 50-year anniversary of Stonewall. We're taking some of that queer design and queer movement, if you like, and we're trying to think about learning in those ways and how we could use it in a, in a more holistic way in, in accounting and business. And what we're also doing with academics is we're trying to question the research process. So if we wanted to think about the research process, we wanted to do the opposite of what we normally do, which is sit in our office, do the research, publish it in our journals where we all talk to each other, and no one really hears about a lot of that stuff. In fact, no one really cares because when's the last time you read an accounting organisation and society's paper? Yeah, me too, right? <laughs> um, so the, I, what we wanted to do is we wanted to put our research in an in in a, in a open space. So we literally took a, an art space in Sydney. It's like a house like this with a massive window like that. And we took over the window. And so we physically, visually put all of our research up on the window so anyone could participate. We put a sandwich board out on the sign. It gets a lot of through fear. And we said, you're welcome. Come in and, and talk to us about the research. More than happy to, to kind of have those conversations. In fact, we want to. We then had people around the tables um, in that process. So we had accountants, artists, and um, academics all working together on this particular research project. We then hired a drag queen and put them in a, the Hotel Imperial, which is where they filmed Priscilla in Sydney. And we put a whole lot of accounting professionals with drag queen. Her name is Karen from Finance. You can Google her. She's really interesting. She takes on an accounting finance persona. And we wanted to really kind of blow um, up that kind of thinking in that process. So we use her a lot. Um, what I'm curious about thinking in terms of conclusion is how can accounting educators play with context in really different and unusual ways? So how do we design as a result for complexity, adaptability and open-mindedness in our learning spaces, whatever they may look like? And I'm also really interested in how do we become comfortable with our own uncomfortableness? Because I think that also can be quite important. Uh, and so, as a conclusion, in order to facilitate future-orientated business leaders for tomorrow's world, do we need to think about accounting education as a way to uh, discover and explore the world around us? How do we create discovery and exploration inside those learning experiences? And if we're thinking in those realms, what role can art play in helping us to do that? Yeah? Thank you very much for having me. It was really, really kind, and I'm happy to take questions. And there you have it. If you'd like to have a look at that presentation, we did make a video recording of the talk. So you can use the show notes in this episode to watch the video recording along with all the slides once they become available. If that link isn't there at the moment, come back again in a few weeks and have a look at the show notes again. That link will be there. From the ARCPA and SEMA office in the heart of London's financial district, I'm Kyle Hannan. We'll be back soon with another conversation that helps you and your profession to go beyond disruption. Till next time. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond Disruption, brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Learn more about today's topic at AICPA-CIMA.com forward slash disruption. This podcast is designed to provide illustrative information with respect to the subject matter covered and does not represent an official opinion or position of the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates. It is provided with the understanding that the association, its affiliates, and subsidiaries are not engaged in rendering legal, accounting, or other professional services. If such advice or expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional person should be sought. The association, its subsidiaries and affiliates make no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to and assume no responsibility for the content or application of the material contained herein and expressly disclaim all liability for such damages arising out of the use of, reference to, or reliance on such material.